And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. God is good. Let's try that again. God is good. And all the time. Good evening, Nottingham Central SDA Church. How are you? I did not understand what you said. How are you? Oh, God, yes, he is. He, it's a habit he has that he cannot break. God is always good. Psalm 100, verse 5, for the Lord is good. When God blesses you, he's good. When he punishes you, come on, tell me, he's good. When he answers your prayer, he's good. When he says no, he's good. When he sent the flood, he was good. When he burned up Sodom and Gomorrah, he was good. And when he destroys sinners in the flames of hell, and none of you will be there, say amen, he will be good. Psalm 145 verse 17 says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways. And holy in all his works. Let me put that in Nottingham English. God cannot do anything wrong. Ah, come on, say amen louder than that. He cannot. You know, Jesus said, they hated me without a cause. No human being or no created being has ever had a good reason to be angry with God. They hated me without a a cause. The God who loves you desires one thing and one thing for you alone and that is the salvation of your soul in his kingdom when he comes. He loves you. He really, really does. Thank you for allowing me to spend this time in your presence. I am honored by this opportunity to speak for God and to speak for God to those who love the word of God. Did I come to the right conclusion? All right. Perhaps you didn't have lunch. That's why you're weak. Your amens are a little lifeless, but that's okay. Fasting is good. Is there anyone among us who is not a Seventh-day Adventist? May I see your hand? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist? May I see your hand? Ah, would you mind standing and telling us your name? What's your name? 
Kevin, hello Kevin, how are you? Nice to see you. Thank you very much for joining us, Kevin. May I ask, where are you from? In where? Oh, just up the road. Now, who invited you? Oh, you come regularly, but not a confirmed member. Not yet. We must speak by faith. Kevin, thanks for coming. May the Lord bless your life, bless your health, provide your needs, bless your family, and save you when he comes. Say amen for our guest who comes regularly. Anyone else? You're not a Seventh-day Adventist. You're visiting. All right. Our subject for this evening, God loves the world, not worldliness. What did I say? Ah, come on. I know, you, I know you heard me. What's the subject for tonight? Not worldliness. Before I begin, let me warn you nicely. I'm an old-fashioned preacher. Can this thing be raised? I keep bending over. And I don't want to leave with a stiff neck. Let me see. Oh, oh, we have an expert. All right. Thank you. What's your name? Murray? Moranga? Okay, I thought that was an herb. Okay, Moranga. Where are you from, Moranga? Nottingham is a good place. Dr. Moranga, thank you very much. God bless your life. What was I saying before Dr. Moranga helped me out? I'm an old-fashioned preacher. I like Bibles. <laughs> These have their place. Don't misunderstand me. This is not a Bible. But I thank God for it. This is a Bible. Let me tell you what I told the church. I was at Manchester. I was in a hotel room reading my Bible. A preacher doing the right thing, reading his Bible. It was actually, no, uh, on the phone actually, I was reading this, the Bible text on the phone. On the bottom of the Bible, an app uh, popped up. <laughs> the, hmm? Okay, on ad, advert. It said, psst, psst, are you lonely? <laughs> no, it actually happened. It was an advert, is that the word? For a dating site. How to date Asian women, they were Asians. Now, no one was in the room with me except the Holy Ghost, of course. But he doesn't publicize your sins. So I could have simply tapped that advert with my finger and faces of women would have popped up and the means by which I could contact them. Listen to me carefully and I'm sure you'll agree that cannot happen on this. If tonight the sermon gets boring and it might, you can find refuge on your phone by going to Snapchat and Instagram and email and whatever you want. You can't do it with this. So this comes with how many temptations? None. This come with endless. And here endeth the agony for you. And that's all I'll say about that. Now, second fear if I ask, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. That is based on Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, which says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. What an honor. To have God touch your mouth, not destructively, but with the touch of wisdom. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. While I am speaking, you pray from time to time in the privacy of your heart and say, God, please put your words in that man's mouth. I'll be very grateful. If you offer that prayer, the words that I speak will be God's words and your mind will be protected from foolishness. Are you following me? So by praying for me, you help yourselves. Prophets and Kings, page 626, paragraph 1. The words of the Bible and the Bible alone should be heard from the pulpit. So I guarantee you tonight, I will reserve all my opinions. I love my opinions, but I keep them to myself. Are you with me? And favor number three, I want you to think as you listen. Think. It's a divine requirement. Isaiah 118, 
Come now, let us do what? Reason together. Thinking is required of us by God. I've often said, if people would stop and think, they would not do many of the things they do. We would not eat the things we eat. I was talking to the pastor when I was a little boy in Barbados. I'd walk on the beach and pick up clams and just suck them down. They were nice and salty. You can pay me to do that now. I did not know any better. There are people who drink the blood of snakes. There are people who eat rats. There are people who eat snails and they call it the escargot. If people would stop and think, what am I doing? They wouldn't drink the things they drink. They wouldn't date the people they date. If they would stop, they wouldn't marry the people they marry. We don't think. We just act emotionally, impulsively. Emotional behavior is natural. Rational thinking comes by effort. And so God says, think. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, speaking for you is an honor I cannot fully estimate. But I thank you for it. Dear God, the desire of my heart is to speak the truth as it is in Jesus. But because I'm human, I'm weak, I'm flesh, I am dirt. I ask you, dear God, to help me. Take full possession of my mind and my mouth. Let me think the thoughts of heaven. Let me speak the words of Christ. And Father, let the words of life you give to me bless your sons and your daughters gathered in your presence. If this service is live streamed, bless those watching online, dear God. Move upon them as you will move upon us. Bless this church. Bless the pastor. Bless this country, dear God. Let the leaders make choices and decisions that are advantageous to the spread of the gospel. And in all that they do, let them remember, righteousness exalteth the nation. Bless every family, dear Father. And a double blessing on all the vulnerable children. And when you come into your kingdom, Father, let many in Nottingham be ready to meet you because of the witness of this church family. Thanks again for the honor of speaking for you. In Jesus' name I pray, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. This side, what's our subject? Too slow, that side. God loves the world, not worldliness. Let's go to Revelation 12. That clock on the wall says 20 after 8. I'll release you by 9. If that's okay, say amen. All right. What book did I say? What chapter? Reading from verse 7. Revelation 12, reading from verse 7. I read from the King James Version of the Bible. All right, amen. Those of you saying amen, you're telling me you found it. The Bible says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth, read with me now, the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. A crisis began not on the earth, but in heaven. Sin began in heaven. Now, our subject is God loves the world, not worldliness. Keep this in mind. Because of sin, Satan and his angels were cast out. And we know from Revelation 12.10, uh, 22.10, the devil shall be cast into the fire at the end time. And we know from 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, the fallen angels shall also be destroyed by fire. And of course, we know that the wicked shall be destroyed by fire. Also, Revelation 20. Now, Revelation 20.10, I should say, the dragon shall be cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 20.10. Okay. When Satan and his angels were cast out, that created a vacancy in heaven. 
Now, my purpose tonight is to get you to understand what God has in mind for your life. When you understand what God has in mind for your life, the attractions of the world will lose their beauty. With this vacancy in heaven, and God is not a God of vacancies, listen to a quotation from the servant of the Lord, and to whom am I referring? Yes, God bless you for saying that. She's becoming increasingly unpopular. I hope that's not the case in this blessed tabernacle. Conflict and Courage, page 21, paragraph 5. What did I say? No, that's not what I said. I didn't say. I said, Conflict and Courage, page 21, paragraph 5. What did I say? God created man for his own glory. That after test and trial, the human family might become one with the heavenly family. It was God's purpose to repopulate heaven with the human family if they would show themselves obedient to his every word. When God made Adam and Eve and told them, be fruitful and multiply, God had an, an idea, an objective in mind that ultimately he would use them to replace the fallen created beings, Satan and his angels. What an honor. In Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 113, paragraph 4. What did I say? <laughs> okay. <laughs> At least you're dying with a smile on your face. Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1113, paragraph 4. Here's what the servant of God writes. Those who in the strength of Christ, and the strength of Christ is in your hands, studied and obeyed. Those who in the strength of Christ overcome the great enemy of God and man will occupy a position in the courts of glory above angels who have never fallen. very polite. You said a few amens, and I appreciate that very much. Did you understand the quotation? Those who in the strength of Christ, and the power of Christ is his word. If you don't believe me, read Genesis 1. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God said, let there be a firmament. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass. And God said, and God said, the power of God is his word. So those who in the strength of Christ, living by every word, overcome the great enemy of God and man. Who is that great enemy? Satan. Worldliness will occupy a position in the courts of glory. Where are the courts of glory? Above angels who have never fallen. Including whom? Gabriel. Is this mic working? <laughs> it is. I said, we will occupy positions with God above Gabriel. And nobody said amen. Let's go to Zechariah. What's our subject? God loves the world, not worldliness. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 3. We read from verse 1. Zechariah 3, reading from verse 1. It's a lovely sound to hear the pages of that Bible turning. Beautiful music in the church. It's dying out, but nice to hear that one. What book did I say? What chapter? 3. Let's pray again. Father, please, God, continue to be with me, I pray. Let not my carnal nature lift up its head. Keep it pressed down, dear God, that only truth may emerge from my lips. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Joshua, Zechariah has a vision and he sees Joshua as a representative of Israel. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. 
And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him now. The angel of the Lord is Christ. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him. Who are those that stood before him? We have to identify that group so that what we're coming to in verse uh, 8 will have impact. He answered and said, this is the angel of Lord Christ speaking. And he speaks to those who stood before Joshua. Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. And I will clothe thee with change of raiment. And I said, let them set a fair mitre upon his head. The mitre was worn by the priest, and we are a kingdom of priests. Can you say amen? And they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. That's Jesus Christ. And the angel of the Lord, verse 6, protested unto Joshua, saying, listen carefully. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, if thou will do what? Walk in my ways. Give me one word for that. Obey. Mm -hmm. And the word if means it's a what? Condition. If thou will walk in my ways. Keep reading. And if thou will keep my charge. Then. Stop. Then. What does then suggest? If you give me money, then I will give you a product. We have a process. One thing follows the other, stay with me. Read the Bible microscopically. If thou will walk in my ways, do what I say. And if thou will keep my charge, all that's connected with my service, then thou shalt do what? Judge my house and shall also keep my courts. Finish the verse. And I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. What does God mean? God is saying to Joshua as a representative of Israel and also to all those who will accept Christ, if you obey me, one day you will be associating and hanging out with heavenly beings. The seraphim and the cherubim and the inhabitants of unfallen worlds. They will be your people. As the young people say, those are the ones you will roll with. If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt judge my house and keep my court, and I will give thee, I will give you, the, he, the, the, the Hebrew word is access. How many people in England would love to have access to the royal family? Or other members of the aristocracy, the earls and the duchesses and the dukes and the counts and the sirs and the lords in the upper house with their ladies and the sirs with their dames. Hmm? God is saying, I will give you access to the aristocracy of heaven. But the condition is, obey me. Now, having established that, listen to the most popular verse in the Bible. Say it with me. For God so loved the world. What's our subject? God loves the world, not worldliness. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, let's take a close look at the world. Let's go to uh, James chapter 4. We'll read verse 4. James was the half-brother of Jesus. He also had another half-brother, Jesus, who wrote a book of the Bible. What was his name? Jude. Very good. James 4, verse 4. If you have the King James Version, you may read with me. The Bible says, Ye what adulterers and adulteresses, Know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Stop. Now, we just said, for God so loved the world. How can friendship with something God loves put us at enmity with God? Because the world can mean the people in it. The world can also mean the lifestyle. And so 1 John 2.15 says, love not the world, 
neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Listen to James 4, 4 again. You still have it? Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Stop. Think. It is possible that there are people who worship every week. Enemies of God. Because the world has such a place in their hearts. But singing hymns, give him offering. But the world, listen to what Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed in John 17, 15. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. The sin in this world, this is referred to as the world. So when God says love not the world, love not the things that are the products of Satan. Even though the Bible says, for God so loved the world, Jesus also said, now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world. Paul says, the God of this world hath blinded their minds. Jesus said in John 14, 13, and henceforth or hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. The devil is called the prince, the God of this world. Not necessarily the mountains and the lakes and the whatever else. It means the lifestyle. The president of a secular, worldly lifestyle is Satan. Now, but that's where we live. We live in a world of sin. And so Jesus told the Father, don't take the disciples out of the world physically, just keep them from the evil. Let me make a statement, and you ponder it for five seconds. Worldliness began in heaven. The system of Satan began in heaven. Let me say it differently. Sin began in heaven. When Adam sinned, he merely adopted the mindset of Satan. And so Jesus can say in John 8, 44, ye are of your father, the devil. Adam did not invent sin. Sin was originated by Satan and it happened in heaven. So worldliness began in heaven and then came down. If God cast it out of heaven, he can't take it back. Are you listening to me? Now, for those of us planning to go to heaven with Jesus Christ, we must get what? Come on. We must get the worldliness out of us. Because it will disqualify us for access to those that stand by. The aristocracy of heaven. I'm telling you that God's intention for your life is to so fit you that when he comes, you will qualify to associate with unfallen angels with face to face with God himself. When that becomes a reality on which we contemplate every day, the attractions of this world will lose their beauty. But the attractions of heaven can also lose their beauty. Listen to these words. Signs of the Times, uh, Review and Herald, January 24, 1888, paragraph 4. Let me give it to you again. Review and Herald, January 24, 1888, paragraph 4. I hope someone is making the decision to write these references down. Listen carefully. I said, by contemplating what Christ has in store for us, the attractions of this world will lose their appeal to us. The opposite can also happen. Here's what the servant of God writes. If your thoughts... Your plans, your purposes are all directed toward the accumulation of the things of earth. Your anxiety, your study, your interests will all be centered upon the world. The heavenly attractions will lose their beauty. The glories of the eternal world will cease to have the force of reality to you.
is a frightening statement, but highly accurate. We tend to gravitate towards that which occupies our minds. Somewhere I read, where the mind goes, the feet eventually follow. Are you listening to me? Where the mind goes, the feet eventually follow. And so the servant of God tells us, if our focus is this life, we will lose interest in the life to come. God loves the world, not worldliness. But how can God get worldliness out of us? Because we're born that way. Let the Bible describe it for you. Romans 8, verses 7 and 8, our subject, God loves the world, not worldliness. Romans 8, verse 7 and verse 8. It's 25 minutes to 9. Do you have Romans 8, 7 and 8? If you have my version, you may read with me because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Stop. Give me a replacement for the word enmity. Hatred. Mm -hmm. Opposition. The Bible says we are born not liking God. And that is evidenced by our attitude towards his word. Now don't look so depressed. There's good news. God has devised a system to deal with that. Listen to Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Or the leopard his spots? Then may he also do good that are accustomed to do evil. We are born in a condition we cannot change. Now the verse says, can the Ethiopian change his skin? The answer is no. But the verse doesn't suggest that the skin cannot be changed. The verse is saying the Ethiopian can't change it. Am I talking to myself? You're with me. The Ethiopian can't change it. The leopard cannot change his spots, but the change can be brought about by a higher power. Name that power, Jesus Christ. That's why he came. To qualify us to fill those vacancies. If he takes us back there in our condition, there will be a second casting out. Are you with me? He cannot take back what led to the initial expulsion. And so he works feverishly, indefatigably to remove the world from us. And by so doing, qualify us for a place among angels that have never fallen. A place that will be ours throughout the elastic endlessness of eternity. My brothers and sisters, are you allowing Christ to get the world out of you? How is that done? To get the world out, something else must come in. What's that? Think of the world and give me the opposite. Heaven. In other words, to get the lifestyle and the principles and the standards of the world out of my heart, I must fill it with the lifestyle and the principles and the standards of heaven. One takes the place of the other. They do not occupy the same space. And how do I fill my heart with the principles of heaven? I give that life to Christ. And let his presence, you see, when Christ comes, he brings heaven. Somebody say amen. <laughs> when Christ comes, he brings heaven. By that I mean he brings the lifestyle, he brings the thinking, he brings the mentality, he brings the environment, and he brings it here. And with that up here, it is evidence in our outward behavior, in our speech, in our conduct. And so Christ can say in his prayer, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Let me review. There was a gigantic expulsion of living beings from heaven because of a rebellion led by Satan, who used to be called Lucifer. Angels followed him, 
and they were thrown out. Not immediately, after a while, because God is a long-suffering God. He did not become long-suffering only after we sinned on earth. He has always been long-suffering. You can see that in his dealing with Judas. You read John 13. God gives clue, Christ gives clue after clue to Judas, turn back. He that gives me the sup after it's dipped. He, he just drops some clues and Judas never turns back. Well, the Bible says, have I not chosen you 12? One of you is a devil. Are you with me? So in dealing with Judas, Jesus is dealing with a devil. Well, all devils are the same. They have different degrees of power. But they're the same. Then by looking at how patient he was with Judas, we can work back and conclude reliably he must have been patient with the original Judas. Christ comes to change this, to change that. And he gives us his mind. With the mind of Christ, we think the thoughts of Christ. We have the expectations of Christ. We have the perspective of Christ. We view the world as we ought to view the world, as something to avoid, not physical, but its standards and its principles. With the mind of Christ, we live in the world physically, but at every other level, we live as beings that actually belong in heaven. God loves the world, not worldliness. Worldliness expresses itself in many ways. The way we eat. The way we dress. Our conversations. Our recreation. The way we spend money. The way we handle our enemies. The way we respond to difficulties and setbacks. The world expresses itself in everything we do. When I say we, I mean those who don't know Christ. Heaven expresses itself the same way. In our death, dress, in our diet, in our speech, in our dating behaviors, in how we run our families, how we educate our children, how we deal with opposition. Heaven or hell expresses itself through us. And Christ has come to ensure that the expression through us is the expression of heaven. Now, you may say, well, how? this is impossible. It's not impossible. One of the challenges we face, we are so surrounded by sin, it is difficult even for Christians to believe that total victory over sin is possible. It just makes no sense. When the angel Gabriel came to Mary and announced that she would be pregnant, in verse 34, then said Mary to the angel, how shall this be? Seeing I know not a man, how can a woman who does not engage in sexual activity get pregnant? That was Mary's concern. She could not understand how. And when the angel explained to her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, she did not necessarily understand, but she knew it would not involve a man. That much she knew. It was a process beyond her comprehension. Because the virgin birth of Christ is still a profound mystery. When Nicodemus came to Christ, John 3, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou knowest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? He could not understand. Shall he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? It made no sense to Nicodemus. What I'm saying to you is this. We are so steeped or so surrounded by sin. It makes no sense to many Christians to say it is possible to come to the place where you sin no more. Methuselah lived 969 years. If a, if a story came on the television, BBC 3, 4, 5, whatever you have, a man was discovered in Borneo and he's 500 years old, everyone would laugh. 
and the announcer would be taken for an evaluation. This kind of evaluation. Because the concept of someone living five, when pe my mother died at 98, when I tell people that, they say, oh my. What would Methuselah have said? <laughs> we are so surrounded by swift death. Even the Bible acknowledges it, three score and ten, that's it. If by reason of strength, they be four score years. There is no nation on earth whose life span is 92 or 93. It's the high 80s, some 40s, 50s. The U.S. is maybe 70s for men, low 80s for women. I know what it is in Great Britain. It makes no sense to us. That's why we must live by faith. Because it doesn't always make sense. But we trust the word of God. When Jesus told Mary, or the woman taken in adultery, John 8, go and sin no more. He did not say, go and sin less. He did not say, go and commit smaller sins or commit them more infrequently. He said, go and what? Sin. Stop sinning. He also told that to a man, by the way. Jesus was fair with both genders in John 5 verse 14 afterward Jesus find him in the temple and said unto him behold thou art made whole you remember the man at the pool of Bethesda sin no more God makes no demand for which he does not provide power to carry it out my brothers and sisters there is power to get the world out of us and that power is the power of Christ in his word. The power of Christ in his word. Nothing else will change the mind. God loves the world. He does not love worldliness. God loves me. He does not love my sins. When Christ comes the second time, he is coming to destroy sin Unfortunately, he will find sin in people. There's something called standing in the line of fire. Every uh, year in the United States, during hunting season, and the hunting season in Michigan, my state, is November, December. You hunt deer and coyotes and whatever else, wild hogs. People are shot. The hunter was pointing at a deer, and some other hunter 500 yards away maybe walked across just as he pulled the trigger. And he came into the line of fire. Now, God is pointing his high-powered rifle at sin. Are you with me? He must pull the trigger. Justice demands that he pull that trigger. But he's aiming at sin. But if the sin is in me, And so God sent Jesus to tell me, move. Get out of the line of fire. Because my father must pull that trigger. The world in me puts me in the line of fire. My friends, let me go one step higher. In Christ, my brothers and my sisters. Get out of the line of fire. God loves you. He loves me. He loves us. He does not love our sins. When Adam sinned, God put him out of the garden. Question for you. How many sins did Adam commit? One. Let me pray again. Father, Sorry, God, I went too long without praying again. I apologize for that. Tell me what the final words are that I should speak. Be glorified through this message, dear God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Adam committed one sin. What did God do? What did he do? Put him out. Now, this is an intelligent congregation. Reason with me. If God threw Adam out for one sin. 
Can he let you in with one? So what does God want? No sin. What did he do? He sent Jesus. That the power of the victorious life of Christ might be ours. This is the only way God gets the world out of us by filling us with the life of Christ or the power of Christ. And the very life of Christ is in his word. Because Christ is physical, he can't be in me. Let me say it differently. Christ still has human form. Don't look so shocked. Jesus still has human form. That's why when he rose in Luke 24, verse 36, and while they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet. Why did he say that? He showed them the marks of the crucifixion. That it is I myself, handle me and see, he went on to say, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Christ rose physically and is still physical. Which means of the three qualities of God, there's one he does not practice anymore. What are the three qualities? Omnipot omnipotence, all power, omniscience, all knowledge, omnipresence, everywhere. Christ does not practice omnipresence anymore. I never said he lost it. He doesn't practice it. Because he's locked in human form, part of the price of your salvation and mine. Because of this, he cannot literally come and dwell in my heart. He does it by the spirit-filled word. Desire of Ages, page 677, paragraph 2. It is through the word that Christ abides in his people, disciples. Let me show that to you even more clearly from the Bible. Go to John 15 quickly. It's 10 to 9. I want to release you according to my promise. Was it a promise or was it a promise I made? Or a statement of intention? You shouldn't break promises, but intentions can fall short sometimes. What book did I say? John, what chapter? 15. Let's read from verse 1. Now, you really have to concentrate. Are you at John 15? <clears throat> Verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. By the way, when you leave the church, you're heading in the wrong direction. The people who say the church is Babylon, I'm leaving. I'm going to start a house church. And no, 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 no. You see, <laughs> you're heading in the direction in which God takes the useless branches. Am I talking to myself? This is what the Bible says. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he takes away. God takes the, the useless branches out of the church. So when you say, I am holier than the rest of the church, let me leave, you're heading in the direction in which God casts the branches. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Verse 3, now you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Now, here's where your concentration must intensify. We're identifying two phrases in verse 4, verse 5, verse 7. <clears throat> verse 4, abide in me. Does someone have a pencil and a pen, a piece of paper? Anybody? I want to, no, no, you write for me. You don't want to write? <clears throat> All right, let's write on the chalkboard of your mind. We have abide in me, come reading, and I in you. So on one side of the chalkboard, right, abide in me. On the other side, I in you. Is that clear? Is that clear? All right. Let's go to verse 5. Read with me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, stop. So we have abide in me again. He that abideth in me and... I in him. So we have it again on this side. Now, so verse 4 has abide in me. Does verse 5 have that? Yes. Verse 4 has I in you. Does verse 5 have that? Yes. Okay, that's clear. All right. So we have a balanced equation so far. Go to verse 7. <clears throat> Are we coming to the end, by the way? Read with me. If ye abide in me. Stop. Based on my hand motion, where should that go? If ye abide in me, over here. 
Mm -hmm. God bless you. Very good. Now, we expect to find its equivalent on that side, which is what? An I in you. Are you following me? Uh, not all of you follow me. You see what I'm trying to say? All right. If he, ab if he abide in me, now the next side says what? And my word abide in you. What does that tell you immediately? Christ abides in us. Come on. Through the word. It's the same thing. This is the only way the world can be removed. <clears throat> because the abiding of Christ is the abiding of heaven. It is the abiding of righteousness. It is the abiding of holiness. It is the abiding of sinlessness, which is progressively expressed. My friends, my brothers and sisters, this. That's your power. Satan violated this. The Ten Commandments have always existed. They weren't invented for Adam. They have always existed, not necessarily the way they were written, but they have existed in the form of principles. And the first one is, thou shalt have no other gods. What did Lucifer say? I will be like the Most High. He violated the Word of God. And the highest passage in the Bible is Exodus 20, 1 to 17. And what's that? The Ten Commandments. Why? This is the whole duty of man. Now, Christ abides in us by his word. Let me show you exactly what part of the word should abide in us. Go to Hebrews 10. <coughs> Excuse me. Hebrews 10. We read from Ella White and we saw from the Bible, Christ abides in us by the word. Let's identify particularly what part of the word really abides in us. Hebrews 10, verse 16. Do you have that? What does that say? Read with me. What does it say? This is a covenant that I will make with them. Come on. After these days, saith the Lord, I will put my what? Where? In their hearts and in their minds. Yes. No. The law of God is the word of God. I mean, is it in the Bible? Is this the word of God, yes or no? Is the law of God in the Bible? Yes. Jesus said, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. The law of God is life to those who obey. Now, go to Malachi chapter 2. Malachi 2. I love the book of Malachi, sweet book. Now God says, you have mis dis disrespected me. They say, how did we do that? God said, you stole my money. How did we do that? God said, you don't come to church. Why do you say that? It's always God says something and they say something else. Very interesting drama in Malachi. Malachi 2 verse 6. God is giving a message to Levi. They're the priests. Or he's speaking of Levi. Read verse 6 with me. What does that say? The law, come on, of truth was where? In his mouth. Read the next statement. And iniquity was not found in his lips. Stop. I'm trying to show you how heaven dwells in the heart or the word of God or Christ. Listen carefully. The law of truth was where? In his mouth. Point to your mouth. Is this part of your mouth? Yes. Now read the next statement. <clears throat> iniquity was not found in his lips. Why was iniquity not found in his lips? Because the law was in it. Where the law is, in its totality, what has to go? Sin. Now, when God truly writes his law, Hebrews 10, 16, where? In our hearts. What has to go? Sin. If the law in the mouth gets rid of iniquity from the lips, the law in the heart gets rid of sin from the life. The problem is, for many of us, the law is written in the Bible not on our hearts. We have the church manual written on our hearts, and so we, we turn every board meeting into a terrorist campaign with a poor pastor head elder who presides. The law must be written on the heart. I don't want to give you too much. 
Ellen White said, don't give congregations too much. Give them a little, let them think. But you, you're smart. Let me give you a little more. Go to Matthew 12, and then I'll finish. It's 9 o'clock. May I have 10 minutes more? Say yes. All right. God bless you. <laughs> Matthew 12, let's read from verse 34. And then I'll, I will keep my word, I promise. You have Matthew 12, 34? Now read microscopically. Read with me. What does it say? Oh, generation of vipers. Carefully now. How can ye, being evil, speak good things for out of the abundance of the, the mouth speaketh? In other words, what comes out of here originates in here. So if the heart is evil, it can only produce evil. But the Bible says the law of the Lord is holy, just, and good. It is spiritual. It is perfect. It is called righteousness. It's called truth. It's eternal. It's right. Now, if that's what's in the heart of a person, hmm? all nine, all ten, sorry, not nine, all ten, that's all that can come out. It's not difficult to understand. If all I do is cause trouble, then something is missing from here. Membership written on your heart does not produce the character of Christ. But don't give up your membership, please. Are you with me? You can write the Encyclopedia Britannica on your heart. It does not produce the character of Christ. Because the righteousness of Christ is in the law. That's why Romans 8, 4 tells us that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Christ came to demonstrate that in his own life. God loves the world, not worldliness. He has devised a means to get worldliness out of us in order that he might qualify us to occupy a position with unfallen angels, unfallen beings, and to associate with God himself face to face. Revelation 22, 4. And they shall see his face. Qualify for that, the world has to go. Let me close the book as a visual symbol of my determination to end. Get the world out of your life, out of your eating habits, your dress habits, your music habits, your romance habits, your recreation habits, your spending habits. But the first step is, Give that life to whom? Jesus Christ. How much of it? All. Listen to Christ or the Bible. Uh, Mark 12 from verse 28. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, verse 29 of Mark 12, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, <clears throat> the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Come on. And with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. Not some, all. Many of us, we love the Lord our God with some of our heart some of our mind, some of our strength, some of our might, our soul. Here's what we say to God. Father, here is my life. Don't tell me who to date. Father, here is my life. Don't tell me how to dress. Here is my life, God. Don't tell me how to eat. Leave that to me. Listen to me carefully. As long as there is an atom of your heart not surrendered to God, it becomes an opportunity for the devil to turn you around. Let me tell you what I told the church last night. In order to save us, you know, Jesus said all, 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 all. He wasn't joking. Which means in order to save you, God needs all of your heart, not the devil. In order to destroy you, he just needs a piece. And we give it to him. 
foolishly believing if we give him a piece, but the bigger piece to God, we're safe. Uh Uh-uh. If you have a Mercedes-Benz S-Class or Z-Class or whatever class, and you see a pinhead of rust, will you say, ah, it's just a pinhead? I'll deal with that uh, in the next millennium. Mm -mm. Because you know, day by day, the pinhead becomes <clears throat> a dime. <clears throat> what do you call it in England? Your little coin. What's it? A pence, okay. Or, and then the pence becomes uh, something, and it becomes a silver dollar. Then it becomes a saucer for your cup of tea. Then it becomes a plate. Then it becomes a serving tray. And so you deal with that pinhead of rust. The instant you see it, What's the pinhead of rust in your life? Deal with it. Take it to Christ, the spiritual mechanic. Let him remove it, thereby removing any opportunity for the devil to interfere with the progress of your life. My friends, God loves the world, not worldliness. God loves you, not your sins. Right where you sit. Confess that sin you've been committing all the time. You know you're wrong. You keep doing it. Confess it to God. Father, take it. You know you are wrong with a capital W. Keep doing it. Tell God you're sorry. Because if you don't, you'll come to the place where that sin looks right. Mm -hmm. As amazing as it may sound... Prolonged exposure to sin makes sin look right. Confess it. Tell God, Father, please, I do not want to do this again. Help me. And that's one prayer God will answer. Tell him, Father, my faith is weak. Help thou my unbelief. Ella White writes, when we pray that prayer, help thou my unbelief, you can never perish. It's not how much faith you have. It's how you use whatever you have. Confess that sin. That besetting sin we carry around like a little poodle, a royal corgi on a leash. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven, help us to understand that we're not saved by church membership. We're not saved by contact with those in high society. We're not saved by the many things we do to keep the church running, as important as they are, Father. We're saved by Christ dwelling completely in the life. We're saved when we're covered by the righteousness of Christ. We're saved when our heart is given to you without reservation. And so tonight, dear God, I've tried in my weak way with this subject, God loves the world, not worldliness, to tell my brothers and my sisters that there's a way for them to escape the clutches of the world and allow their hearts to be filled with the atmosphere of heaven in the person of Christ who indwells his word. Dear God, right now, inject into us a dislike, a hatred for sin. The very first promise of the Bible you made, Father, here's what you said. These are your words, dear God, and you don't lie. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. You have promised to put hatred in us for the things of the devil. Because of Adam's sin, we're born hating you. You have arranged to create in us a hatred for sin. Because no sinner hates sin. Dear God, have mercy upon us, Father. Have mercy upon us. And bring conviction to that man, that woman who's struggling with a sin that needs to be led aside. Give that person a conviction that's uncomfortable, that's distressing until action is taken. Lord, Remind us you love us, dear God, but you don't love sin. And in order to qualify us to occupy the atmosphere of heaven and walk around with angels and unfallen beings, 
the sin that led to rebellion in heaven must be removed from us. The worldliness, dear God, over which the devil presides must be removed from us. Please, God, do that as your people pray and confess those sins. They know they're doing and they know they are wrong. Burden them with guilt, dear God. Trouble their conscience. Let it affect their health. Until they say, Father, forgive me. And their eyes open to the beauty of a clear conscience. Please, God, bless this church, Father. I choose to believe every member of this church in the heart of the man or the woman wants to do what's right in your sight. That's my belief. Help them to do that, dear God. Now, Father, take my puny effort and clarify it through the instrumentality of your spirit and reapply it to everyone who listened so that as they meditate on it tonight, lessons will come to them that I was not able to present. Father, thank you for your patience. It seems almost endless. Thank you for being long-suffering. Again, I ask you to bless this church, bless the pastor, bless the leadership, Father. Leadership is not easy, God. Moses asked you to kill him because the Israelites were so troublesome. So bless the leaders, Father, give them wisdom from above, that the leadership may take the earth, the world, uh, the church forward and upward. Bless the conference in which this church is, bless those leaders. Bless the union in which this conference is, the division they God. Bless those who administer this church at the highest levels, particularly Elder Wilson. Ah, Lord, the burden on that man cannot be imagined. Use him. And let us find time to pray for him and others. Now, God, as we prepare to leave, assign a mighty angel to every person that we may arrive at home escorted by the powers of heaven. Let that angel watch over us as we sleep. May it please you to give us life tomorrow. And if that's the case, may we commit that life to you the moment we open our eyes. Hear this humble prayer, Father. Save us when you come. Until then, keep the world out of us, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen.